Hello, Wilkinson here. My guest today is my friend, Patrick Bohaska. He wears many hats. He's an author, he's a life coach, and he's a really good guy. I've been looking forward to chatting with him, and this is my opportunity. So say hello, Patrick. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm quite welcome. I'm glad to have you. I've been looking forward to this, as I said. There's so many things we could talk about, and we're going to talk about a lot of them. But uh, we could talk about your first book, which is Brain Cells. I think I have some left. Uh, we could do that, or we could talk about whatever your favorite thing is, uh, <laughs> life coaching or your book that you're writing now. I know you're in the middle of one. What do you want to talk about? Okay. Well, you know, people have often asked me what conversation I most want to be a part of, and I think that's a really important question. And I am all over the map, and I'm actually pretty happy that way. I am very comfortable talking about personal empowerment. I'm very comfortable talking about gay men's sexuality. I'm very comfortable talking about spiritual expansion and mysticism and ascension and awakening and all of that. And quite often, I like to blend all of those different topics together. I like to talk about gay men's spirituality and personal empowerment, for example. So my website, my website is sexpowersoul.com. And the reason I chose the name sexpowersoul.com is because I believe that there is immense personal power at the intersection of sexuality and spirituality. And uh, one of the courses that I've taught in the past, it's called Good Sex. In this course, my, my core teaching is that when you think about what good sex is, you know, some people think good sex, it means sex that follows a certain set of very moralistic principles. Mm -hmm. And other people think good sex means hot sex, you know, passionate, fun, right. uh, memorable sex. And in my mind, it can be both of those things. That's They're not mutually exclusive at all. So that's my favorite thing to talk about. Oh, we're not going to talk about that. Okay, I'm awesome. just kidding. <laughs> like let's I talk, said, I'm happy talk about talking about all sorts now, of I, different I, things. I do want to. I do want to put that in my GPS. So, what was that inter intersection again? <laughs> ah, sexpowersoul.com. All right. So, just tell us a little more about it. I'm sure everybody's all ears at this point. Mm. <laughs> well, several years ago, I was a college professor. And I was working at a small liberal arts college that had a religious slant to it. I can't even remember what ordination, what denomination it was, uh -huh. but it was a Christian school in Iowa. And I was in the Department of Philosophy and Religion, and I wanted to teach a course on world religious perspectives on human sexuality. And the, the name of the course I had was Good Sex, because that's that's been my central topic of study for decades, sexual ethics and so forth. And the university, the college, did not want me using the title Good Sex. They made me change the title to something technical like uh, <laughs> re religious perspectives on human sexuality. Could you and keep the... Was the course the same though the course was the information the was the same just the title they were scared of that they were scared of the title okay. uh they thought that it would attract a number of students who thought it would be an easy a and looking for titillation and so forth and those students when they did come to my you know there's always a few of them they were surprised because it actually was a pretty technical course but the central focus of that course was the proposition that human sexuality can follow a specific set of moral principles that are in alignment with spirituality. And it could be incredibly fun at the same time. And one of the, a, a lot of the principles that, that I pulled out of different world traditions on human sexuality the ones that I found that were the most empowering were the ones that were along the lines of New Age principles. Um, oh, really? Interesting. In a lot of different religious traditions, sex is regulated through shame or guilt or some other type of 
emotional energy that says you're bad for being sexual. You're, you're not merely bad for having sexual thoughts and doing sexual activities. There are a number of traditions that actually teach that simply by virtue of having a human body, you are inherently sinful, you're inherently tainted, you are inherently on a path to hell. And that's a, a belief system that I fundamentally reject. Okay. And it exists in a lot of religious traditions, but I, I tend to believe that human beings are born with physical bodies and physical desires and needs and urges and so forth, because that's the way we're meant to be, that that's the way we're designed, that's, that's who we are. And to squelch that through shame or guilt or... Um, you know, to fit somebody else's misguided notion of manhood, for example, that that all you do is deny your humanity in that process. And, and if you're denying your humanity, how on earth are you going to grow spiritually, you know? Right. Um, so, so was this class for gays and straight and everybody, or was it slanted one way or the other? You know, it's kind of funny because, of course, there was no mention of who the course is for. Right. It attracted primarily people who were interested in exploring their sexuality. And Whatever when people are interested yeah. in exploring their sexuality, it means that they don't come in with a preconceived set of, of notions that they think they have all the answers for already. So what that meant was a lot of LGBTQ-oriented students coming in to the course and they really added a lot to the conversation. And what, what year was this? This would have been 2003, maybe, 2004, okay. I think. So You know, I, I have a lot of house guests here. And what I've noticed with a lot of the millennials is they're very fluid about everything. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> we have a lot of discussions. And uh, they're not set one way or the other in a lot of things, which is, and it's pretty well across the board is, you know, talking to them. I mean, some of them are like, you know, hundred percent gay. They may say that or hundred percent straight. One said that he wasn't, but, <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's interesting that things seem to be changing and they are very fluid. And, you know, the fantastic thing about that is that fluidity isn't exclusively about their own sexuality. They're fluid in terms of other people expressing their individuality on their terms. That's a really beautiful thing. You know, this rigidity. So they're they're open-minded. They're open-minded. Yeah. There, there are pockets of rigidity that are left over throughout the United States. And even among millennials, there are pockets of rigidity today that... Um, but, you know, we're moving in a certain direction. We're moving into an age in which the old world rigid um, values and belief systems are breaking down. And we're beginning to realize that, that uh, we're more than just physical bodies that need to be um, regulated in a certain way in order to create wealth or whatever it is we're trying to build for ourselves. Uh, another way to put that is in previous years, we pretty much had a set of beliefs that told us that there's one way of doing things. And if you do anything else, you're, you're inviting chaos, you're inviting um, social structures to decay from within and fall apart. You still see this in a lot of um, political discourse today. People like Marjorie Taylor Greene and uh, other people like that who um, basically exclude anybody who isn't completely heterosexual or male or female from the definition of human. So it still exists. Right. And back in 2003, 2004, in Iowa, in this small Christian <laughs> town where the college was, there was a lot of rigidity. And the rigidity was baked into the, the college. So I got a lot of pushback. There was a lot of oh, um, wait, interest. Was, the pushback was from, from whom? The pushback was from people who felt threatened by me possibly talking about something that 
made them uneasy. So were so we're students talking or faculty administrators, or okay. faculty members, other people okay. in the philosophy department, people who would come up to me and say, how can you possibly teach this course in a department of religious studies as if religion and sex are mutually exclusive? I even had, I've always been openly gay. Right. And I even had one person corner me basically and just pound me with the same question over and over again, basically saying you cannot be gay and be interested in religion at the same time. That religion means that you must absolutely reject being gay. And that it's just such a sad way to... And if you're gay, you must reject religion. Yeah, if you're gay, you must reject religion. If you're religious, you must reject the homosexual lifestyle or however they want to phrase it. And it's the desire to control the world by putting everyone in a little tiny pre-assigned box that is labeled. Mm -hmm. Uh, if If people are successful in doing that, they might find comfort in the world that they create. But those people that are trapped in those boxes are not going to be happy. And that doesn't make for a productive society. Hmm. So is the book going to be basically the material from the class? Or oh, have you, okay. what, ha- no. what happened here? The, I've come I, a long you probably, way uh, since teaching You've probably lo- learned a few yeah. things in the last, uh, what, 19 years? <laughs> yeah, well, in, in the intervening time since 2005, 2006, I've gone really deep into the esoteric laws of the universe, law of attraction and related principles, and I've developed a pretty deep and sophisticated understanding of how energy flows in the universe. And a lot of that is, it, it filters into what I write in the book that's coming up. The book I'm talking about is titled Good Sex, And it's going to be released in June of 2022. And I'm working on the final draft of it right now. And I'm really excited about it. But is it is it a picture book? Is it a picture (laughs) book? I wish. Yeah. (laughs) If if it were a picture book, it would probably sell a lot more copies. Right. (laughs) I need illustrations for this book. Uh (laughs) Um, But, you know, really the book is all about how to embrace your sexuality and step into your personal power as a gendered being, however you choose to define yourself. Okay. And Okay, so so now connect the dots with the law of attraction. Let's talk about that a little bit and bring it back and tie it into this. So I, I'm expecting that you, not only good sex, but you can tell me how to attract it, right? Yeah, well, that's <laughs> that's <laughs> okay. So in a nutshell, without going into too much depth, okay, we basically create our experience in the world, and perhaps we even create the world itself through our thoughts, our beliefs, our judgments, our expectations, our traumatic memories and other emotional and mental energies. Okay, so I get we that. are okay. constantly through our belief systems creating the the reality that we live in. If your belief is that I am broken because I am gay, right. then you're going to live a life of brokenness every time you want to express yourself as a gay man. So what a lot of people do who have that belief, they don't want to feel broken, so they pretend that they're not gay and they lie to themselves about who they really are, but you can never be fulfilled if you're living a lie. Exactly. And in the world that we live in right now, there's so many people hiding behind masks, so many people living a lie because on the one hand, they're afraid of how other people are going to react but also because they have some sort of belief system in them that tells them that they are inherently broken or bad or they should be ashamed of themselves or they should feel guilt for having certain natural urges that other people disapprove of. So when you create the world that you live in through your beliefs and your judgments and your expectations, if you believe that you are worthy of ridicule, you will be ridiculed in this lifetime. You attract that energy into your life. If you believe that you are whole 
and loved and worthy of love and that you're safe, you basically build for yourself an environment in which you have all of those basic human needs met and you're free to be happy or you can develop happiness. You can experience happiness as a gay man or woman or, or whatever the orientation is. And I, I think there's a lot of power in our belief systems about ourselves. Now, I grew up Catholic. As a Catholic boy, I was taught that not only is it in, inherently shameful and disgusting to think uh, a homosexual thought, let alone act on it, I was taught that simply because I had a physical human body, I'm inherently tainted by sin. And therefore, I am inherently sinful and that I must rely on an external savior in order to cleanse me of my taintedness. Otherwise, I burn in hell for all eternity. So if I had internalized that, that belief system, I'd be absolutely miserable today uh, as a gay man wanting to live a happy life. You know, what holds a lot of people back is lies that they've been told by other people who want to control them, want to define who they are. And we end up going through life allowing other people to tell us who we are and what to think and what to believe and, and so forth. Um, we lose track of who we really are. We think that we're the mask that we're wearing. And that you know from experience, because you've talked about this before, how liberating it is to finally strip off that mask and say, this is who I really am. Right. There's a lot of power in that. Hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about the law of attraction and let's say a partner or a partner, whether you're gay or straight, whatever. So... I'm just sitting here wondering, do you think there's like the one out there or what's your thoughts on that? Or do on you the think, one? Yeah. There's only one right one for you or, or what? Oh what gosh. Are, what I've never believed that. That's, you that's, you know, I think that, well, when I work with people, one of my goals is to clear away their limiting belief systems. And I often ask them the question, does, does that belief limit you or does it liberate you? Is it serving you in some way? A lot of times people have the belief that there is one and only one perfect match for them. And in my mind, that's a limiting belief system because what that means is you live in constant anxiety that you're never going to find that perfect match and you're going to have to settle for something else. It prevents people from dating because... You know, you might be in a situation where you want to go out on a date with somebody, but you know he's not the one. And oh my God, what happens if you meet the one while you're connected with this person? You're going to blow it before it even starts. Right. Or you might be in a long-term healthy committed relationship with somebody, but it's not feeding you. And you're thinking about moving on from that, but you have in the back of your mind, oh my God, but that's the one. I will never, ever <laughs> meet anyone who ever loves me like that. Um, of course, if they were perfect and they yeah. were the one, then you wouldn't be thinking about leaving, yeah. most likely. <laughs> now, the thing is, you know, some people have that experience. Some people find, encounter somebody they fall madly in love with and they have a lifelong relationship where they're madly in love with each other. And that's beautiful. It's also very, very rare. So I'm not discounting the possibility. I think your belief systems come into play pretty prominently that whatever you believe, that's what ends up being true for you. So if you do believe that there is one and only one perfect match for you, then that's probably what you will experience. But for me, I, I do kind of see it as a limiting viewpoint. I also see as very limiting the notion of um, a twin flame who completes you. There's in popular music and in literature and so forth, there are all sorts of representations of I'm half a person. I'm incomplete without that other person in my life. Right. That somehow I am less by myself and I need that person in order to make me fully human. So, you know, we get this vision of, of I'm half a person. 
he's half a person, we come together, we create a whole person. And that's beautiful. And that's where our power is. But it's really difficult to go through life as half a person, you know, it's, uh, right. and it really puts a lot of pressure. And I would say even unfair pressure on somebody else to do the job of completing you when that's actually your job. It's, it's your job to bring yourself into the uh, sensation and awareness of wholeness. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and a lot of what we see in our romantic literature and love songs, especially and so forth, there's often a depiction of love that is almost parasitic in nature. Like I'll die without you, without you, I'm nothing. Uh, my life is meaningless without you, can't live without you. And that's definitely the way you people sound like often a songwriter. Feel. Yeah. Well, that's definitely the way people feel, but those are right. actually pretty limiting beliefs, limiting feelings. Right. And unfortunate part of that is that if you truly believe that you cannot live without another person, then you fit the definition of a parasite because that's what parasites are. They, they die without their host. So like I said, it's your responsibility to heal you to do the healing work that will bring you into a sense of wholeness. And then when you meet somebody else that you have a chemical reaction with, and they're a whole person, then you end up with a relationship that's mutually, mutually supportive, mutually respectful, loving, and not where the two partners aren't constantly living in fear that the other one is going to leave them. Right. I heard yeah. somewhere a long time ago, you know, when you're, when you're talking about all this stuff, people think you're talking about the half a person, half a person. So they're doing addition when in actuality they should be doing multiplication. If you're whole, so it's like one times one equals one. So yes. then you have a one, the one healthy couple. And even if, you know, you're divided, it, it's still going to, you're still going to be whole still, even if you weren't with that person. So Absolutely. I think, I think that's what you're saying. Yeah. That's beautiful. Hmm. What else is in the book that any other nuggets in there that you can talk about? Well, I do like to talk about, I can call them humanistic principles, okay, new age principles, you could call them of how to, you know, how to engage in sexuality in a way that is uh, healthy and healthy for you and for whoever else you come into contact with. So, you know, I'm talking about new age principles. And one of the new age principles that you probably have heard in the past, especially if you've gone to yoga classes, is the namaste principle. You know, namaste, mm -hmm. you've heard that word? Yes. So literally the word namaste means I see you. You know, I, I recognize you. It means hello right. to you. But in modern American yoga, it's taken on kind of a, a deeper meaning. And it means the divinity in me sees and recognizes the divinity in you. So if you can carry that attitude into your sexual life, there's, um, I mean, it's a really beautiful attitude to have where you never lose sight of the fact that you are a, a divine being. And you recognize the divinity of the other person. What that means is when you're engaged in the whatever sex act you're engaged in, you're treating the other person as fully human and you are respectful and you expect respect in return. Um, well, now, I think that, that goes not just for somebody you're partnering with that in that way, but just the people that you meet. Yeah, yeah. I it mean, goes if you're for looking at them in that everyone. way then, I mean, you, your judgment drops away, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you see them in a different way. Yeah. Because if I can see myself in you, then I'm going to not judge you. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, but if you're deeply consumed with self-hatred and self-disgust mm. and so forth, then I'm you will be judged. I'm yeah, talking about so, a healthy person. Yeah, though. absolutely. Yeah. So the interesting thing about, you know, these different principles that I've laid on, I can't remember, it's something like 20 different principles that all are drawn from new age or humanistic uh, philosophies is those are what I say help define what is good sex, but bad sex isn't the absence of those things. I mean, I don't think that that for sex to be good, that you should never, ever have a one night stand or you should never, you know, have a, a quickie with somebody. 
you know, there are certain sex acts that are done for the sheer pleasure of and the celebration of physical pleasure with another person that might not rise to the the level of recognizing the divinity in the other person. But that doesn't mean that that sex is bad. Bad sex would be the negation of that principle, treating somebody, intentionally treating them as a piece of meat and gotcha. intentionally uh, intending to degrade them in the process or mm -hmm. uh, rejecting their humanity. That, that would be bad sex. So, you know, sometimes people get squeamish about principles, principles, moral principles, ethical principles for good sex because it sounds like rules and regulations, but these aren't rules and regulations at all. These are merely guidelines for respecting the humanity of other beings and embracing your own as well. Because they're not rules and regulations, there's absolutely nothing in the principles I explore about it has to be between a man and a woman, or it has to be in the context of a marriage, or it has to be exactly two people, no more, no less, you know, anything like that. Those are rules and regulations that are basically designed to control people. And they work for some people, but insisting that they be universal is really just desiring to control other people's sex lives because you feel threatened by them. Now that you said the book is primarily for gay men. Uh, no, the book is not primarily for gay men, but... Um, who, who is your audience? Uh, the think? audience is anybody who's interested in, in developing a deeper awareness of their own sexual nature and exploring their sexuality. Okay. Now, I'm a gay man, and I write what I know. So I write from my experience, and therefore, it probably sounds like I'm speaking to a gay male audience primarily. Mm -hmm. But the principles that I well, talk about Well, you are in Palm are, Springs, you yeah. know. Come on. And I'm in Palm Springs, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> where, will the, uh, where will the book be available? It will be available on Amazon. I think the publication date is July 17th. Okay. But, or sometime in the latter half of July, definitely. Okay, and it'll be listed on there. And uh, tell everybody the name of that again. It's Good Sex. And spell your last name for everybody. Prohaska, P-R-O-H-A-S-K-A. That sounds great. Do you have any other words of wisdom? Any pearls before Believe we end this? Believe in yourself. Pardon me? Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. Okay. You know, we go through life constantly being told by other people that you can't do this, or you're not allowed to do that, or you're going to fail at that, or... You know, why would you want to do that? What's wrong with you? It's it's time to throw away all of the phony limitations and the, the bogus expectations of other people and begin to really shine your light. And when you do that, you give permission for other people to do the same thing. And then that's how we step into our wholeness. Sounds good to me. I appreciate you coming today. It was great chatting with you. Yeah, thank you very much. This and I will fun. definitely be getting the book. I've got your other one, so... I'll get this one too. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very Have much. Have a great day.